866-95-PATRIOT. Help expose the liberal left with Breitbart News, Sundays with Stephen K. Bannon. There's a man going around taking names, and he decides who to free. If it's Sunday night, it must be Breitbart News. Everybody and I'm honored to be your host, treated. Stephen K. Bannon, All here on Sirius XM, the Patriot Channel 125. Our number is 866-95-PATRIOT, 866-957-2874. It is very ironic that we're starting this segment with Johnny Cash's uh, great song about the apocalypse of the St. John's um, Book of Revelations, when the man comes around, because we have with us in, in studios our guests for the next couple of segments, Diana West, and Diana is a uh, a prominent New York Times bestselling author of uh, the Death of the Grown Up, but she's got a new book out that is a as close to I can get to saying something is a must read, and I don't say this very often. The book is American Betrayal: The Secret Assault on Our Nation's Character. Now, this is a book that is principally about the Cold War and what went on, the real history of the Cold War. But it is absolutely so incredibly relevant to what's going on today and against this great war against radical uh, Islamic fascism that the West is currently you know, fighting. And I continue to say we're at the top of the first inning of this or maybe the bottom of the first inning. But this is a long civilizational struggle, which uh, many, many people in Washington, D.C. don't want to talk about. But, Diana, thank you very much for joining us on, on Bright Bird News Sunday. Thank you, Steve, and I'm delighted to be here. Well, listen, let's talk about the what what compelled you, of all the different topics you had, and coming off a big bestseller, which uh, The Death of the Grown-Up was, what compelled you to then take on, really, the true history? And by the way, M. Stanton Evans, who, who I love, says that this is the needed antidote to the court histories of all the books that have been written about the Cold War. You really don't understand it until you read this book, because you go through in, 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 in fairly minute detail about the communist infiltration into the United States, starting in the New Deal. What compelled you to go take a couple of years of your life and write this book? I never imagined I would be writing this book. This book happened to me more than that I set out to write it. Um, as a weekly columnist at the time, I was actually editorial writer at the Washington Times confronting the post-9-11 world. I spent the next several years um, trying to understand how we could get hit on 9-11, hear the President of the United States tell us Islam is a religion of peace, and then watch as the public square was dominated by politicians, pundits, all manner of discussion, marshalling ideas, facts, to support this completely illogical, ideological statement. And I was very sensitive to that because I was, as I mentioned, writing editorials, writing my column. And my first book, The Death of the Grown-Up, was really my first whack at thinking through how we could be amassing facts and never get to a point of judgment and how we were seemingly diverting from fact-based narrative. And actually, that would be a pejorative. You're judgmental. Yes, right? exactly. You're, you're judgmental. It's like, it's is like, it's like When people say right. that, they're like nine years old. You're judgmental. Right. Which is, again, telling you to suspend your judgment, to suppress your natural reflexes, to suppress your constitutional ideas. It, it goes on and on, and it's, it, 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 it becomes quite a morass of confusion. This book, I realized that maybe the death of the grown-up was not enough of an ex explanation of why we could not judge, why we could not stand up, why we could not define our enemy, etc. And I set out again to go back a little deeper, a little farther, and at a certain point I actually asked the question in the book, what if the death of the grown-up were a murder? And what I mean by that is what if this setup goes back so far that the precedent for what we're seeing today in constructions of big lies has this precedent in our past. And indeed, I found that, for example, Islamophobes today are people who shut up about jihad. Red, red, um, uh, red baiting of yesteryear was the word that silenced 
silence people who were trying to examine the communist infiltration of our country. And I realized that the ideological link was there and there was a lot of research to be done to try to bring this all to book. And that is how I went down a rabbit hole from 9-11 into the 1930s. Okay, this is incredibly important because I think this is the key to fix a lock. Go, give us death of a grump again. Because I think this is this – is, in this city – and every week, and on Breitbart, one of the reasons we're, we're so proud and we call ourselves the Fight Club, we don't put up any of this crap. We don't put up any of this nonsense. We're, we're, we're the, you don't come to us for opinion. We're not, you know, have a bunch of op-eds, although we bury some of it, all of our different pieces. But we're coming back at you relentlessly on every issue that's fact-based, like the immigration. People are saying, well, how you guys have done 4,000 articles. This immigration bill, when you look at it, is so outrageous at every level, and the facts are being spun. Your death of a grown-up. It permeates this city, that, that this thing of the big lie, that it's all media spin. I mean, that's one of the reasons Andrew Breitbart, our spiritual founder, said, hey, it's all nonsense, right? They don't want to really address what the issues are. They just want to spin it in their own way. In that book, wh- what, is, what is it that got us to that point? Is that why you had to go back yes. and really do American Betrayal? Because you couldn't answer it. By the way, the one thing was we can't even call it radical Islamic fascism, which it is. You can't even call it jihad. Why don't you talk about Steve Coffin or some of the stuff that you had found here in this city today of people. It's like if you saw the movie The Untouchables with, with, when Kevin Costner played Elliot Ness and they say, we all know where the whiskey is, right, in the Prohibition in Chicago. Remember with Sean Connery, that great scene, he says, we all, everybody knows where the whiskey is. It's the political will to take the axe and chop down the door. Everybody knows what the radical jihadists want to do. It's just nobody in this town wants to talk about it. Well, that's true, and I would say that that in the the sort of the the metaphor of the death of the grown up, there is an answer to this because what you are seeing is is a society that, of course, has been worshiping youth and the cult of youth for generations. But what that has done to us has made has really stultified our development as people who can speak freely, take on issues, confront things. So, in a sense, our Diminution, our stunted mentality actually makes us perfect candidates for being conquered by jihad, conquered by Islam, made into dhimmi, which is, of course, the people who live, Christians and Jews who live under Islamic law. We are silent. Under the religion of peace. Under the religion of peace, you are as silent. As long as you're spiffing, as long as you're silent, and you're spiffing X amount you're of your You're silent, income. you're paying taxes, called the jizya for the privilege of not being uh, conquered all the way. However, it is a repressed, suppressed existence. This, I argue in that book, is where we developed into the perfect sort of dovetailing with this expanding Islam, this age of expansionist Islam. What I do in this book, however, is go back to find the parallels, to find out the seeds of this, which okay, are so in was, our okay, past. So something was bugging you. You're saying, yeah. how did the United States, the greatest nation in human history, how did it get to a position of this, which is so catastrophic, and that was the taproot. That's what really American Betrayal, your new book, the, the secret assault on a nation's character. You went back and you found that in our great war against the Soviet Union. Yes, I went back, and this was a great shock to me. In fact, the whole book was a great shock to me. In fact, every day as I wrote the book, I was shocked. I was sitting in my study, usually in the dark, because I tend to write at, you know, in the 4 a.m. hour, and uh, I was alone with this information, so it's actually a great relief to be able to talk to you about it. What I found was that our leaders had betrayed us, had lied to us, but in this depressing and shocking revelation, I found also great confirmation that we were we were going through something again. For example, if George Bush and Barack Obama have been telling big lies about Islam being a religion of peace, I discovered that Franklin Roosevelt told the American people the exact same lie about communism during World War II. We had wartime censorship. Communism was portrayed as something very compatible with democracy, just as Islam is today. Um, we also had uh, uh, the, the sort of cult of Uncle Joe Stalin being the affectionate nickname of Churchill and Roosevelt for this mass monster who had to be pre- presented this way to the American people who frankly did not wish to supply material and munitions to the Soviet Union going right up into our beginning of the war at the end of 1941. They had to be lied to. Let's go back because I want to talk – break this book down for a second. Um, in American Betrayal, you actually start back in the 1930s. This was taking place very early on in the New Deal. Yes. That 
there was an active program by Soviet. And by the way, this is the great thing about your book is there's 40 pages. Sister West did not leave it to your imagination. <laughs> Diana really na- – there's – how many pages of notes? There's well, the- we have 961 in notes. 961. <laughs> no, because your head – on you every have to. On you every have to. On every paragraph, your head's blowing up. Yes. And you're going, this can't possibly be right. true. You look at a footnote, you go back, and she's got a documented. You had to do this because they would, they would have crucified exactly. you if you hadn't. So yeah. this book, when you read it, 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 don't take my word for it. Don't take Diana West's word for it. When you read it, just flip back to the end notes, and you'll see that everything's documented. Soviet military intelligence um, very early on had this. We know in history that German intelligence with the Bund organization and that Japanese intelligence. I know today everybody you know, whines about the, uh, the incarceration of Japanese Americans, and I'm not saying that was correct. However, we do know that Japanese intelligence in San Diego, in Hawaii, in Norfolk, Virginia, and other places like that were look ahead. But in your book, you show something that's never mentioned. Soviet military intelligence very early on targeted the New Deal and targeted getting intellectuals and people into the system. Exactly. Yes. Well, this is this is really the crux of the book because what you're looking at is this infiltration, this this penetration by American traders working for Stalin into the very fibers of our government and other institutions. And it began early on. Really, it began as soon as the Soviet Union came into existence back in 1917. However, we had four presidents and six secretaries of state who refused to normalize relations with this revolutionary entity, the Soviet Union, because they had declared that they wanted to overthrow the world, including the United States, including our Constitution, making no bones about it. I mean, their number one thing was world revolution, right? Against world the capital, revolution. Against the capital. I mean, these guys were not, they were not trying to play hide the football. No. They were, they were upfront about what they exactly. were trying to do. Exactly. Just as we see Islam is very upfront about notions of the caliphate and overthrowing your, your, your constitutions and so on. Franklin Roosevelt recognized Soviet Union on November 16, 1933. And I actually came to see that date as America's fall. And here's where we get into the subversion. By the way, pr- pretty, yeah. early, pretty early in his administration. By the way, first six yes. months. Because back then you weren't inaugurated right. until March, correct? Exactly. So, exactly. Were, so in the first six months, mm-hmm. given that from nineteen from the revolution in what, 1916 or 1917? 1917. All those presidents and secretary of state had absolutely refused even to take it seriously. Never right. really made any moment at all. Bang, right out of the box. He, he, right out of the box. And think of this, Stephen. In that same period of time, we have the, the ending of what we now think of as the Ukrainian terror famine, where you had five, six, maybe more millions of, of people starved on purpose by Stalin. And then six months later, the United States normalizes relations. I mean, frankly, think forward to 1945, and you have to scramble history a little bit. Imagine, after the Nazi government kills six million of its own people, six million Jews, a government decides to normalize relations six, million, six months later. It is a moral, it is unconscionable, and yet this is what happened. And Because it, they had starved yeah, those people. They, they had they, starved okay, them to okay, death that's on what, purpose. What, a lot of people don't know the details. They had starved it's to death a region of the country that would not buckle under right. centralized Soviet command. They had starved these people to death. It's, it's horrific. I'm not saying it was it, – it wasn't the industrial uh, eradication and genocide that the Holocaust was, but at the end, it still killed six million people. Yes, exactly, and yet it was okay to recognize that country at that point. On a list of lies, the actual exchange of notes is interesting to look at. It basically was a series of promises the Soviet Union would make to us that they would not attempt to overthrow us, that they would not support secret cadres of agents in this country to overthrow us. Of course, that's exactly what was going on. The signatures on the piece of paper meant nothing, and it only ramped up after that. Because their philosophy is, once again, like the, the jihadists. The jihadists can lie to you because in their thing, you don't count. So in their moral universe, it's not a lie. Just like with the Soviet Union. Exactly. Since the number one Very thing is, is revolution. It's the same ideological. Lying to a capitalist doesn't count because you're a capitalist. You're, you're somebody that's got to be – is going to be eradicated anyway. So in, in their moral universe – it doesn't matter if they're lying. In fact, lying is actually a positive thing. Because it advances the ideology, exactly. And so what we see from that point forward is this tremendous influx of communists, of fellow travelers, 
into the fibers of, of our government, of our institutions, to a point, I actually am looking at this because now, you see, here's the, here's the, 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 the sort of the um, secret ingredient for the book. We actually have a cheat sheet now after the dissolution of the Soviet Union in 1991. We see archives opening it first in yes. Moscow. Interestingly enough, after that, they opened in Washington. These were archives that opened briefly, selectively, to disclose to scholars Soviet intelligence cables. These cables... This is, this is the Verona files in, this in the This would be KG. Verona in yeah, Verona. the U.S. Yeah. and various archives, you know, sort of catch as catch can, frankly. Yes. And, and they're incomplete and so on. But what we see is confirmation of, of Amer bona fide American traders working for Stalin throughout this, this period, um, and it, it, it becomes absolute confirmation of what suddenly, I mean, we're talking not just one Aldrich Ames, the famous turncoat, we're not talking five Cambridge spies as led by Kim Philby, a very famous British spy ring. No, we're talking hundreds. We're talking hundreds. And I'm looking at this, and you're seeing how strategically placed they are at the top of power in the White House, in the OSS, which is the precursor to the CIA, across the government, um, all the State Department and so on, I suddenly start thinking, oh my gosh, I'm looking at an army of occupation. Soviet occupied Washington. In effect, obviously, a strategic army of secret, a secret army. However, influence is such an important part of espionage. You know, we usually think, and certainly movies and television and so on teach us this, that espionage is all about stealing that secret plan or that formula. No, that is part of it, but the more the more really vicious element is the influence operation, the disinformation operation, even just tipping the right person into the right job who can then influence policy. And this is what you see in spades. And so I suddenly begin Taking to see... Taking over the HR department. I tell you what, yeah, let's take a short... Sure. Idea. Our guest is Diana West. She's the author of a blockbuster book, American Betrayal, The Secret Assault on Our Nation's Character. Uh, we're going to take a short two-minute break on Breitbart News Sunday or a return with our in-studio guest, Diana West, in a couple of minutes here on Breitbart News Sunday. Your values, your voice, Breitbart News, Sundays with Stephen K. Bennett. Breitbart News Sunday, Stephen K. Bannon, Sirius XM, The Patriot Channel 125. Our number is 866-95-PATRIOT, 866-957-2874. I want to apologize to all our listeners for not getting to these calls quicker, but i um, been quite frankly mesmerized by Diana West and her new book, American Betrayal, The Secret Assault on Our Nation's Character. If you get it, <laughs> A, you won't put it down, and B, you'll be flipping back to the uh, notes section because every paragraph of your hair is going to be on fire. Ward in Alabama for Diana West and Stephen K. Bannon. How can we help you tonight, Ward? Yes, sir. Miss, uh, or, or ma'am, I should say, Miss uh, West. I, uh, I'm really intrigued on the subjects of, of uh, the espionage and the deceit end of it and, and how it, it, we should be worried about it as far as the um, Muslim issue goes. But I wanted to know in modern times, is there some way or equation that you've made that we can tell when dimitude is starting to come around? And I believe it's pronounced takia, the takia. permissible line. Yes, takia is how I've heard it. Yes. Oh, Ward, absolutely. Ward, thank you so much for uh, for your call. Great, great, great insight. Dimitude is all around us. It has been thick and toxic clouds of it ever since 9-11, ever since we have failed to simply confront the facts about jihad, the facts about dimitude. We have centuries and countries and cultures and continents to look back on, and we have a body of Islamic law to evaluate and understand that it is entirely incompatible with any sort of liberty-based rule of law society as our constitutional republic. However, we have this fear factor, and I think that is where you get to dimitude. And from the fear factor, you get the diminution of your own society, your own rules, your own freedom of religion. We no longer have these things anymore. And if we just look to Europe, we see where we will be in maybe five, ten years. Um, this is a very serious problem. It, it is a crisis, actually. And it is something that I spend okay. most of my time chronically. Okay. But yeah. okay, so I want to talk to you about this crisis. Sure. And, and we'll tie it back to the book. Um, 
you mention and you start your book off by talking about after 9-11, and one of the first examples that you use is President George W. Bush coming up right after the attacks and saying religion is a uh, Islam is a religion of peace. Now, that administration had run on being heirs to Ronald Reagan and the Reagan Revolution. So how did Rumsfeld and Cheney and Condi Rice and George Bush, how did they, I can understand people make the argument about President Obama, and I'm not arguing he's a Muslim or not a Muslim, but it's very different with progressive left administration than it is with guys that ran on a national security. How did they get it wrong? They got it wrong with the wrong set of advisors. I mean, these were all people who'd come up in the Cold War. And these were all people, I mean, Condi Rice is, is reputed to be a Soviet expert. And here they were facing an Islamic threat with absolutely no understanding. They ended up with people who are apologists for Islam. They ended up doing all this Muslim outreach to groups that we now know have been identified by the U.S. government as Muslim Brotherhood fronts. That would be CARE. That would be the Islamic Society of North America, also known as ISNA and many other of these groups that have become the handmaidens of our security arrangements and of our strategy. And this has only been multiplied in our wars in Iraq and but Afghanistan. But isn't that because the Central Bee, and it's different than the Cold War, the Cold War, the, when, particularly in the Great Depression, people didn't realize at the time whether the Soviet Union or the capitalist system of the United States, because it was a trial of capitalism of whether it was going to go away or not, right, in the Great Depression. Here, one fundamental difference is that it's the banks, it's the investment banks, it's the hedge funds, it's the private equity funds, it's the law firms, it's, it's the power establishment in the United States is inextricably linked with the cash coming out of the Middle East. One of the reasons you look around this town, and I keep telling people, the reason that you have a dramatic uh, influence campaign going around with the Muslim Brotherhood, everything you say is absolutely correct. When you listen to Major Cough, Stephen Coughlin's presentation, you get it, right? And there are voices out there of rationality that are being mocked and derided every day. And the reason that the establishment looks the other way and the Bush, the, the Bush apparatus looks the other way is because um, there's so much cash. There's so many petrodollars being funneled back through this town. Absolutely. And it's not just Muslim Brothers. You mentioned it's Saudi Arabian, it's Qatari. You've got... You've got, you know, uh, Children's Hospital here in, in Washington, D.C. has a Qatari wing. We've got Saudi money right in, in Georgetown, in Harvard, in Fox News. I mean, this this is... Al Jazeera, Al Jazeera now has Al a... Jazeera. Ma Al Jazeera has a major operation, has a major operation, cable operations, that's trying to get approval by local cable operators. And in Breitbart, what we're trying to show is what Al Jazeera shows in the Middle East and what they're going to try to show here. It is an influence and propaganda organization that's going to be on your cable TV every night. And by the way, they're getting uh, all the people that been fired at CNN are all going there to work. Exactly. I mean, the, the way that you would have to, to outlaw this kind of thing is to, to make it either morally uh, punishing or legally punishing to become involved with money that is attached to Sharia dictates that is Sharia compliant because that is so completely you know what? antithetical you're be, you're, to our own you're, liberties. You're being judgmental. <laughs> that's right. I do it every day. No, but isn't – I think that's what you mean by <laughs> the death of the grown-up. Is yes. that you can't – the people – because once they say it, well, you're – Paralysis. How did this moral relativism – Yes. How did this inability, this political correctness, this inability to look reality in the face, where did it start? This influence operation, right. by the way, <laughs> here's the key thing in her book that you've got, and this is why I so wish Andrew Breitbart, one of the reasons many of he was here, because he would get this about media. Your point in this book is that they didn't do it by hammer blows, and it's not James Bond, and they're not stealing the big right. secret, although they did get to steal eventually the, the atomic bomb and stuff they really needed. It wasn't in that. It was much more insidious than that. It was this influence. It was this influence uh, operation of which they got us to really stop believing in ourselves and and, and, and believing in their false in their false doctrines. Correct. Well, that's I, that is so powerful. It, the, yes, that's that's part one of it. The other part of it is that in preserving this alliance between the United States, which let's just imagine that we are a fact based constitutional republic at the point at which we make this. 
this, this alliance, this normalization of relations with the Soviet Union, a revolutionary entity where there is no, the ends justify the means. In order to preserve that alliance and to, to look the other way as we're being infiltrated, to, to ignore the penetration, to ignore the twisting of um, standards and, and commonalities among nations, in a sense, we learned to lie. And this learning to lie gave rise to double standards in our foreign policy. And lo and behold, we have double standard upon double standard. We begin colluding you mean, in the big we, lies. You mean we had learned to lie in, in order to make ourselves feel better about having almost a version of Hitler as our partner yes. in Stalin. It, that we had eight, to look, yes. Of the 30 million people we killed, we had to look the other way. Of how they yes. ran the gulags, we had to look the other way. Every time he had a Solzhi Nitsen, it was, it was quite uncomfortable. Embarrassing. It was embarrassing. He was locked embarrassing. Locked out of the White House. He right. got, yes, he got locked out of the White exactly. House. Right. This, by the way, got locked out of Jerry Ford's White Jerry House. Ford's it was White a Republican House. White House yes. he got locked out of. Absolutely. No, that is exactly it. And it isn't just looking the other way. At a certain point, and this is why the book is called American Betrayal and why it is it is it is so it is heartbreaking. There are, there's much of the book that is quite heartbreaking. We began to collude. In other words, we began to not just look the other way, but to participate. And that would be either in participating in, for example, the repatriation of Soviet claim nationals at the end of World War II, whereby British and American forces were ordered by their governments to return by force some two million Soviet claim nationals to certain death or gulag. This is the kind of which is never which is never mentioned. Which ever, is never mentioned which, in our good war. I mean, right. this is the kind of thing where you see court history, you see big lies, and so this this just snowballs to a point where no longer should conservatives scratch their what heads. About the con- what, what, what about the concept of the enemy of my enemy is my friend, and that you can't pick all the time. You know, countries don't have friends. They have interest, right? And in the, in the, in the great war of European fascism, of what was p- coming up in Italy, of what was obviously in charge in Germany, of what potentially was coming up in England, in that war, it was determined that these communists, as bad as they are, will be our partners to destroy that. And then Patton and other guys said, hey, these guys are just as bad. We've got to take this on now. Well, that was a large propaganda campaign. And indeed, Solzhenitsyn, when he came out and came to the United States in his very first speech, he actually said, why couldn't you defeat one monster, totalitarian monster, and then defeat the other? I mean, this, this, is, a, this is a very valid question. However, I think there's something that everyone always misses, and I, <laughs> it sounds like a blanket statement, and it is. The United States and Britain wanted to defeat Hitler's Germany. Stalin's Russia wanted to supplant it. And that is indeed what happened. And that is indeed became the goal of the Soviet agents in the United States. In other words, the war had to continue they had a long term, enough. They had a longer term strategy. They had we a long term right. strategy and they wanted that Red Army into Europe. And right. so the war couldn't end too soon. I mean, this is sort of where you start, your right. head does explode when you start realizing that the, the, the effort was to keep the alliance with Stalin. So your argument, going, your argument is that, yeah. the, is that, is that, is that where there are many people in Britain and in, 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 in France and the Gaul saying we have to, you know, you, you went to North Africa, you went to Italy, skip Italy, let's go and land, let's have D-Day in 1943. The whole thing of the Soviets, one of the things of saying, you know, don't do that or slow that down was the fact that they want the Red Army to get ready so that they could do their own march across Germany? Well, it's a, they wanted us to essentially, I mean, we had invaded Europe through Sicily into Italy. Yes. And essentially, I mean, one of my aha moments, I was reading a very excellent history book where there was a, a line where it said, essentially, we had to we had to leave the continent of Europe in order to reinvade it in northern France at D-Day. And frankly, I had never thought of that before. In fact, I hadn't thought much about the Italian war at all. All. This was a mistake as far as Stalin was concerned. And of course, this was the great battle but that Churchill continually wanted to see us go up through the middle to be close to Germany and eventually, as he realized Stalin's goals, to forestall them, to keep them away. So yes, this became a technique to put the Americans and the British out of reach. And there was also one of the most shocking things I discovered. There was actually a significant anti-Nazi German resistance that was trying, we don't know if it would have succeeded, but was trying in very many, there are multiple instances and multiple American and British uh, facilitators trying to move this idea of overthrowing Hitler in exchange for help in keeping the Red Army out of Europe. That was always the bargain that could not fly in what I consider to be communist-occupied Washington or London. The book is American Betrayal. The author is Diana West. Um, The 
today in modern pop culture, you know, they call Ted Cruz the Joe McCarthy. If you want to think of who devils are, it's Ronald Reagan and, and those who name names at the House on American Activities, the Hollywood Ten are heroes, right? Sure. Um, Alger Hiss is a hero, right? Richard Nixon's a villain. Uh, Joe McCarthy is a villain. Your book makes very cl- plain that these guys were right. Their, the place was infested with either traitors who were on the direct payroll of Soviet military intelligence or fellow travelers who were kind of compliant in helping these guys get along. I mean there's, ab- there's absolutely no question. How is pop culture – so changed it that is it, it, white is black and black is white. Right. Well, this is the big uh, chasm, if you will, between reality and where we live, <laughs> where our society lives. And this actually goes to the, the point of the piece I wrote for Breitbart this week, namely that we have not reconciled what we know about the infiltration now due to those archival revelations we've had since 1991 and forward – with the general narrative of the war. If you go to the bookstore today, the newest biographies of Eisenhower, the newest books about the war or the conferences or the Cold War, they do not reflect this confirmation of many important people working in Washington at the time who were actually working at Stalin's behest. It is as if they are still undercover, even though we have this confirmation. So what I tried to do in this book was weave the two narratives together. And the reason this has not been done before, I mean, how can you suddenly do something new about World War II and the Cold War? It goes to the notion of the occupation of the American Academy by Marx, essentially. Actually, either people are trained not to see this or they're in denial and they won't see it, or you do not advance in your career if you do see it. So in a sense, this is a very important sort of bringing together of two important tranches of American okay, experience. What we're going to have to do yeah. is this book is so big, the topic's so big, and particularly at the contemporary issue we face today yeah. about Islamic fascism is so important. We're going to have to bring you back next week or the week after because we've got to get – but how do people get – how do they get this book? It's on Amazon. I take it's in all bookstores right now. Uh, where has it been reviewed? Are the reviews out there? The reviews on uh, Amazon are terrific. Yes, is the New York Times. The did, the, did, did the New York Times have a have a front page of review on this book? No. <laughs> did, the, what, <laughs> did the Did the LA Times have a uh, book? No. Front page? Neither did the Wall Street Journal. Now they did review my first book, which is kind of an interesting thing. Um, but so far, a, it's this, been silent. This, this cuts it a little too close to the bone, particularly what you say. That is why the book is American Betrayal. The author is Diana West. It's the secret assault on our nation's character. Once you read this book, so much becomes like you have so many aha moments in here. And that's why it's so powerful. It's such a contemporary book. Diana, we're going to figure out – she's going to be up on Breitbart a lot because this whole thing about the Muslim Brotherhood infiltration in our country is a real – at Breitbart, we're not kooks and we're not conspiracy theory guys. But this is a clear and present danger to our nation. And you can lay it out, you lay out the facts, and then you guys make the decision. That's what we're going to be doing at Breitbart News. Our guest is Diane West. We're going to have, uh, we're going to take a short commercial break. When we come back, we're going to have one of the stalwarts of the conservative movement, Al Regnery, the founder of Regnery Publishing. He's currently the uh, founder of the uh, legal defense fund for the police officers throughout the country. We're going to talk about this bizarre. 